Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior. With a proven operator and finance team, Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks. His website is RickAckerman.com. He's speaking to us from Colorado. Rick, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Jim. Thanks for inviting me on. Amazon. Now... They seem to be inescapable when it comes to new business products and production. And you say there's one thing that makes Amazon stand out among the fangs is that they're a real company. They actually give you physical products. Right. It's not Snapchat or Uber or uh, even Airbnb. You know, uh, Amazon is real brick and mortar. And uh, it extends not just to the warehouses, but they're building transportation infrastructure. And uh, the things they build employ many, many people. And in the sense, uh, in the capital investment area, it's it's really what the uh, the uh, Hayek and, and other economists have had in mind when they say, that uh, you really have to build things and hire lots of people, that uh, building railroads and and uh, oil rigs and things is what truly adds wealth to the economy as opposed to the financial asset and uh, real estate inflation that we've been having since uh, the Fed stimulated us out of the Great Recession. So Amazon is the real deal. And um, I don't like what Amazon pretends for the future because it's a, it's a very deflationary business model uh, all by itself uh, all by themselves Amazon is going to put out of business many 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 uh, large department stores not just stores but whole chains of stores so this is uh, Amazon is in, in a sense uh, bringing on that creative destruction that uh, is ultimately valuable and uh, constructive uh, f- and constructive for the economy. So I look at Amazon then first of all, first and foremost is uh, the key bellwether stock and as long as it's moving higher, it's inconceivable to me that the the stock market's going to break that the bull market that just entered its 19th ninth consecutive year will end. And uh, in that respect, we've had Amazon uh, push up to a new all-time record high this morning at, uh, let's call it 900. It was a couple pennies shy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's been above, uh, spoke too soon. Uh, since I last looked, it's been above 900. And uh, it's uh, at the, what I call, midpoint hidden pivot resistance. This is uh, my way of uh, doing technical analysis. I have my own method. And uh, the bottom line is, if it can close above 900 for a couple of consecutive days or trade uh, maybe six, seven, eight bucks above it intraday, I think, uh, it w- not I think, it will put a target at 1,086 in play. So that would be quite a move, almost 25%, I believe, for Amazon. And as long as that's going to happen, uh, anybody who's waiting for this bear market to breathe its last is just going to have to wait. Well, what makes Amazon so interesting is that they're a terrifically innovative company. All that talk about them delivering packages by pilotless drones makes headlines and makes things interesting. It may not be all that viable, but it certainly shows that they don't stop thinking about how to expand their business model. That's true, and not only that, when they say that they're going to deliver packages by drone, you don't just sort of roll your eyes and think, Geez, you know, these futurists are so full of it. Uh, Amazon has a lot of credibility. And when they talk about some innovation that really seems like the future, we all recognize that they are exactly the kind of company that's, that's capable of getting us there. And, and what are their new products? Amazon Pay, you can pay for things using your phone, and there's no fee. 
Right. They've uh, they've kind of mastered the art of making things free, and uh, Amazon Prime in particular is a brilliant example. You know, they they charge you whatever it is, ninety bucks a year, I think, to join Amazon Prime, and it makes it possible to buy a great number of things from Amazon with no shipping charges. But they managed to build on the Amazon Prime membership by offering other benefits with it, and uh, as you know, or you may know, they they're, they're kind of they're building out uh, TV production and, and TV subscriber services from Prime, and uh, you know they started with an, an, a captured base of a zillion customers, and and they've they've leveraged Amazon Prime brilliantly. Well, sure, and that ninety bucks up front gives the company so much more freedom to do things. And I saw a program about Costco. Their main money generator is that one hundred and eighty dollar annual fee. So having an annual fee apparently is the way to go for a company. Yeah, and with Amazon, it's just a piece of what they can sell you. You know, the fee helps to uh, defray their the expenses they have of uh, administering your account. And of course, they get a little piece of everything they sell. I don't remember the exact uh, percentage figure of stuff that Amazon uh, that, that is sold through uh, third-party vendors, but it's uh, obviously a very large percentage. And uh, Amazon keeps getting uh, better and smarter about how to bring uh, not just big partners in, but but smaller ones. And it suggests that they're capable of essentially dominating the retail chain from uh, from the, the little guys up to the very largest uh, vendors. Now, getting back to Amazon Pay, is this the way of the future? Cash is eliminated. Well, if there's a company that's going to innovate new and easier ways to pay, Amazon's certainly going to be in the vanguard there. Uh, Apple has done its own work, but you can see that uh, it's getting to be the, the dollar's got a lot of competition, and certainly uh, it would seem that the the check clearing system is on its way out. It's uh, so very cumbersome. But uh, we've got Bitcoin and a number of other encrypted currencies, Bitcoin being the most popular of, the, of them. But uh, the, the advantage of Bitcoin are that you can do transactions with no fees and that you can do them in any currency. Um, Amazon, as, as you just uh what you just mentioned is a uh, fee-less transaction process, and you know that it's just a short step for them to implement that same uh, the same process globally, so that you can have uh, fee-less transactions in any currency, the same as you would with Bitcoin. Is this bad news for currency traders? Uh, no, I think you know we've seen. Some of the European currencies, the British pound and the Swiss franc, they've sort of hung in there for a lot of years while the euro uh, bore the, let's call it the brunt of uh, international uh, uh, trading and speculation. Uh, but uh, let's, the currency is becoming uh, much more competitive, and it's, it, it would seem as though the government is already, uh, just because it's going to happen, ceding its monopoly, its currency monopoly, and to some extent, uh, at least as rumored, it's even getting in the game with the idea of uh, an encrypted currency that would be of U.S. mintage. I'm wondering, too, with President Trump being worried about trade deficits and so on, could he do something like insist that Canada and Mexico use the U.S. dollar to even up the field? No, nobody can insist on on something uh, like that to happen. You know, currency is fungible, and so are the things that it buys. So that when we hear of, uh, you know, the major oil producers saying we're going to take payment only in gold or only in this or that, uh, they're really bluffing because uh, for the moment it's very it's very helpful for them. Uh, it's essential for them to be taking payment for uh, crude in dollars simply because uh, dollars are infinitely abundant. And uh, if if they were to insist that all buyers of natural gas or refined petroleum or crude uh, were to pay, let's say, in a very hard currency like gold, you would see their sales go uh, 
into the tank. So, uh, so the, the, the medium, the dollar is a medium of exchange for energy is uh, working for everybody, uh, despite the, the talk of, of some of the producers like Venezuela and Iran uh, and Russia of colluding to squeeze the dollar out. They can't do it because we all love to pay for crude in, in a currency that is, as I said, infinitely available. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after the break. Alvin Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. What do you see happening to oil this summer? Well, this is something we've talked about uh, a few times, and I haven't changed my my mind. You know, when we saw uh, crude headed up into the uh, into the toward sixty dollars, this was back in uh, January. Um, there was a problem with the story that was driving this rally, which uh, for crude began back in. January of a year earlier, 2016, crude was around 36 bucks a barrel back then, and uh, here we are rallying to just shy of 60. But the story we were hearing was uh, about the curtailment of supply. So uh, you know, some of the big producers, Saudi Arabia is obviously the big swing producer, and they were going to bring. Uh, whip into line some of the other producers and they were all going to agree to produce less oil and drive up the price. And although that's possible in the short run, we've got such a, a global glut, most particularly coming from uh, U.S. fracking supplies, that uh, it's very hard for OPEC and uh, what, uh, for the Saudis uh, to make these price increases stick uh, on a basis of reduced supply. You know, all the, all the suppliers are eager to pump as much uh, oil as they can uh, because they've all got bills to pay, even the Saudis do. So so here was this, you know, every time it was rumored that uh, the, the producers were near some agreement that would help to cut back on supply, we'd see oil uh, rally. But to me, the story was a, was a phony. Uh, it, it had no credibility from the start simply because a, a true bull market in crude would not be driven by a a supply-side curtailment story. It would be driven by increased demand. And in that respect, uh, it was plain to see that it wasn't coming, mainly because the largest uh, buyer of crude, of energy, at the margin is China, and uh, China's economy has been relatively soft in recent years. So if we were to read that uh, things are really starting to hum for China, and that won't happen really until global trade, broadly speaking, picks up, and, and that is not a trend that I foresee coming. So so you're not going to see a demand-driven uh, story for oil, and that's why I think the rally, the potential of it was limited. Uh, we did see a top in uh, January up around 58, just a little, little below $58 a barrel, but since then, we've come down to as low as 47 bucks, and uh, maybe a month or two ago, we, you and I talked about a 43 target of mine. China as well, I think one of the restrictions for their growth is the lack of infrastructure for vehicles. Ten years ago, everybody rode bicycles to work. Now they're trying to drive their cars. They have nice wide freeways, but not the exits and entryways that you need to make those freeways efficient. China has, they, they, they always, they're, they're still on this kind of Stalin, 
Stalin is central planning model, and we know from the experience of Russia in the 1930s that uh, that really wasn't the best way to grow the economy organically. China has all these ghost cities. The the idea being, you know, build it and they will come. So they've got buildings, some of which would serve as uh, offices, some would serve as think tank uh, think tanks and this and that. But it turns out that uh, no central planning, just building a city, can anticipate the complexity of, of an urban economy. And, uh, you know, for starters, you really can't fill those think tanks unless you have uh, feeder streams from uh, universities. There have to be students and, and uh, universities, and they students have to be there for a reason, and they need uh, also to, to be able to support themselves uh, in, in these cities where they live to pay their tuition. So, so it's it's beyond the the realm of planners uh, to to kind of think a large city through. So, in the same way, you know, China sort of builds the roads and discovers they missed some exits, or uh, they they will discover they missed some exits because it will only be determined uh, organically through through everyday usage <laughs> where people want to get off. And also, if you want think tanks, you need independent thought. And that's the last thing the Chinese encourage. Well, I, yeah, I mean, you, you hear that the, 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 they're sort of straightjacketed, that the thinking is kind of regimented by the needs of the central planners to have certain things happen. And I think that's true to an extent. And for sure, uh, you know, a little loosening up of, of capital really is where it happens would help China, but the state is interventionist to a, a huge extent. You know, the Chinese government really has uh, it's very serious misgivings about ceding the operational control uh, uh, of certain businesses, so the government's got its hand in everything, and of course that is a, a, a constraint uh, on capital. So, uh, you know, the, their, their financial the marketplace is very different from ours, and uh, I guess you could say that when they're growing, they grow in spite of themselves. A lot of experts have said India is really going to be the economic engine of Asia eventually. Their biggest problem is that they're hugely bureaucratic and wrapped up in red tape, but their big advantage over China is that they're a democracy. Uh, yeah, it helps that they're a democracy, but, but uh, you know, they've sort of grown their their own uh, stalks from the roots that the uh, the the british planted and um uh the result is that uh, as democratic and as uh, bureaucratically uh, organized as as india is it's hugely corrupt and inefficient and and corruption itself is the root of the inefficiency there and it's such a you know it, it it's really the way of doing business you have to grease some palms over there and uh, that's uh, going to be a surmountable hurdle for India to overcome if it wants to build uh, businesses where uh, capital can not only flow, but it can feel rel- rel- relatively secure in, uh, in, in getting what it pays for. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, what's your outlook for gold right now? Well, I like to take it one step at a time. Gold uh, has been uh, arguably in a bear market since July of 2000. Uh, 15, I'm sorry, 2000, it's been a bear market really since 2011, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I've, in looking at it with my own, uh, through my own technical lens, I use something I've developed called the hidden pivot method, uh, disappoint us 
uh, in many rallies, and uh, it just it gets almost as far as you want it to go, but not quite. And then it slips back precipitously. But uh, I, I can more or less give you, I can more or less guarantee that the June COMEX contract, uh, currently trading at twelve hundred fifty-eight dollars, is uh, is going to reach. A, t- a target that I've been using for the last couple of weeks, 1275.80. And uh, if we should see gold pop through that target, I call I refer to that as a hidden pivot resistance. If it pops through it pretty easily the first time it hits it, uh, that would be a, a bullish sign. Now, we've heard some incredible predictions for the price of gold, $5,000 an ounce, $10,000 an ounce. Any hint of that? I, I've never gone along with that sort of ridiculous, you know, we've got, I think, Armstrong out there predicting 40000 for the Dow, but people who put these ridiculous numbers, uh, you know, that, that float them, uh, are, are really just promoters, and uh, it's just kind of a sales gimmick. You know, nobody can make, a, a, I, I don't think anyone can make a great argument that's go, that gold is going to 5,000. And, uh, you know, we've got some people talking about gold at 50,000. But, but the fact is that uh, y- you, could, you could make a case, you could say, well, there's so much paper gold out there that if ever there were a crisis and the paper gold essentially exercised its claim on real gold, we would have a short squeeze on physical metal. But uh, that presumes that the government will fall right in line and say, hey, all you bullion bankers who are short gold up the wazoo and who have been making huge sums being short gold, well, you've got to settle up on these contracts. So, you know, even if it bankrupts Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and the rest of you, you've got to pay, pay the little guys off, you know, with, with, the, with the gold that uh, they have, have paper claims on. So that's never going to happen. And, and even, you know, to my most ardent gold bug sub- subscribers, I say, I tell them, if gold should spike to some ridiculous price, you better be really nimble and, and clever when you go out to talk to some farmer about trying to exchange a handful of Krugerrands for, you know, 50 acres of his land because he's going to look at you and say, I can't eat those Krugerrands. So uh, in, in the situation that uh, that presumptively would drive gold to untold heights, there would it, it, it assumes... Uh, a, a crisis that would make gold, uh, on the one hand, very valuable, but paradoxically uh, not as valuable as the, the top of the pyramid there, which is the food, the food chain. And this was true for the German hyperinflation. You know, if you anyone who t- took out a hundred percent loan to buy farmland in the spring of 1921 uh, was able to pay off the entire loan. Uh, with the first harvest of potatoes, so we, we we shouldn't kid ourselves about the value of gold in a real crisis. Yeah, and speaking of food, the Earth is losing its topsoil at the rate of one percent a year. Or so over the last thirty years, we've lost a third of our topsoil. Apparently, we're only three or four percent away from having a worldwide food crisis. That I, I focus only on about a half a dozen things that could do us in, but that, that that's one I haven't looked at. And another one I try not to think about too much is is uh, if, if uh, some smallpox virus that has been kept frozen in labs should get unleashed. So I, I just sort of focus on a an epic deflationary collapse and some of the easier stuff. Rick, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks. His website is rickackerman.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for Rick or for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.